So yeah, I've seen many pictures and it looks so romantic. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's a perfect way to describe it. Yeah. <laughs> oh. But thank you so much, Kyle, for, for doing this and everything. I so much appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. I, I mean, I've seen your website and it's just, it's so lovely. I think everything you do is just fabulous. So I'm really honored that you asked me to be one of your, um, your interview <laughs> subjects. Thank you. Um, so tell me, give me a little bit about your background. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, well, I mostly grew up in New England. Um, I, I spent the first like six or seven years of my life in Alaska. Um, my parents were teachers. They're up in the um, the kind of remote villages, uh, mostly with the Yupik native people. Um, and so after I finished kindergarten there, we moved back here to New England. Um, and then I spent the rest of my childhood in New Hampshire. And uh, my, my dad in particular loves folk music. So there was always like a lot of music in the house. And uh, I think certainly that that influenced me. And um, so I, I started singing at a really young age. And I would say though, it wasn't until I was in college that I was like, I think this is what I wanna do professionally. And, um, oh, I'm just seeing your beautiful cat. And so, uh, <laughs> that's Sophia. Hi, Sophia. Oh, she's beautiful. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so, so I was, yeah, so I was in college um, and I, uh, I went to a place called Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York. And um, there was a wonderful, there was and still is a really wonderful folk coffee house there called Cafe Lena which I started volunteering at every weekend and I got to just listen to the most amazing folk musicians. And um, I think that's really when I came back to that music of my childhood. And that was when I started also becoming interested in Celtic music. And um, I started learning a little bit of Irish Gaelic and uh, I went to Ireland for the first time. And um, after I graduated from college, I went up to Cape Breton, Nova Scotia for a year on um, something called a Fulbright Fellowship. And I was like studying Celtic music and the Scottish Gaelic language. Um, and that was only for one year. So then after that, I went to um, the Isle of Skye in Scotland and I went to a, a, um, a complete like immersion program in Scottish Gaelic. And I spent a full year there learning the language and reached fluency. Um, and then a year after that was when I recorded my first album and that was when in Ireland. So that's kind of the abbreviated, <laughs> I know, I'm sorry, that's a lot, but. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah. was it difficult learning um, the Gaelic language? Because I hear it, the way that it looks, it is not pronounced. <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> that's so true. I think that's probably one of the hardest things. I mean, um, Structurally, it's actually a very like learner friendly language. Um, I think something like English is actually much more difficult because there's all these weird rules that get like broken and there's, you can't depend on anything and Gaelic is not like that. So oh, okay, <laughs> I know, I feel like we're so lucky to be native English speakers. Oh, I'd hate to learn it, but, um, but yeah, I mean, for example, Gaelic only has like eight irregular verbs and you use them all the time. So you learn them quickly. And like, otherwise, it really just is not one of these languages that has all these exceptions and instances where the rules get broken. I think the hardest thing is, like you said, you know, learning how to kind of make sense of what you're seeing on a page. Um, and the sounds are quite different from English. So that that's a little challenging, too. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah. was it mainly um, Scottish Gaelic or Irish Gaelic that you learned? Yeah, great question. So originally, um, my my interest was kind of more in Irish, but I discovered there, unfortunately, there isn't anywhere in Ireland that you can go to learn the language in like a full immersion setting. It's kind of like you can take it at college and a course and, you know, you can maybe go live with a family that speaks it, but they'll probably speak English to you most of the time because it's easier. Um, and so there, so I, when I found this place on the Isle of Skye, I thought, well, you know, Scottish Gaelic is close enough. That's also a beautiful language. Um, 
<laughs> and I'm actually now I'm kind of glad that it went that way because it's more it's not as widely spoken it's more kind of unique um and it just it needs it needs more people speaking it so I think it kind of worked out well in the end <laughs> um, yeah I was kind of also looking um languages up because there are so many languages that yeah. are slowly dying off yeah um, yeah one um because I was looking um, through them, the Native American language is kind of slowly dying off. There was one woman who actually, I'm going to have to relook up the story, but she made a dictionary just by writing down one word like every day. Wow. So that people could learn it. Oh. But I guess um, the Irish and Scottish languages, yeah, are kind of on the endangered list. Yeah. Oh, they are. They are. And wow, that's so inspiring. But yeah, I mean, Irish is, is doing better than Scottish Gaelic, but certainly it's kind of like, it's definitely borderline. And um, Welsh is doing better than all of them, really. And um, unfortunately, that's surprising. I know, I know, such a small country, but they've really, um, they did, a, they just did a great job of like, a lot of like national pride in their language. And, and that I think just makes all the difference. Um, so they're very like protective of it. And um, yeah, so the, so Welsh is doing really well, but um, Cornish is gone. I think Manx is nearly gone. So it's, it, I know it's such a loss when, when that happens. This little piece of humanity, you'll never get back. I know that's what sad. it's like, there's nobody left. And I've read this, um, of, like I said, several languages. Um, I guess there was there was one in um, Italy um, oh. where you, where you said you were going. Um, she's from Naples. Oh wow! And I think um, she spoke a certain language and wrote a book. But I think very slowly. Yeah, it's kind of sad. You're watching a lot of languages kind of disappearing. And it would be nice if those came back because it's mm. like you kind of lose a part of your your culture and yourself when yeah yeah guys. Do, do you think the reason is is because English is so prominent and it's easier for them to kind of I, I think so I, I think just yeah because we're so interconnected these days that it's 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 easy for, for one language, I feel like, to just kind of take over. And of course, that would be English. And, um, and, I, think, uh, and I think it really depends on your cultural background. I, I think, um, you know, cultures that, that have less of a history of um, like colonization and oppression, from what I can see, do a little bit um, better job of pre preserving their languages because they're not really bringing that um, that historical baggage into it. Um, and the Scottish people, unfortunately, just because they have been through so much oppression um, by the English, it, it kind of reflects on how they even view their own language. Um, whereas the Irish, I think because Ireland always remained independent, um, they're a lot more um, a lot more kind of like possessive and proud of their language. And that does make a big difference. And I think the same for the Welsh. I think the Welsh managed to kind of keep the English at bay pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, and so, and I mean, maybe that's similarly with the Native American languages. There's such a hard history there that it's, I think it can really impact how, how people view their own culture sometimes, which is like heartbreaking. I, I, it just makes me sad to think about it. But yeah, it's such a, such a complex thing, I think, isn't it? Yeah. And when I find that story, I'm going to have to send it to you because it oh, is yeah. so wonderful because she, she just typed out one word a day and that's how she came up with the dictionary. That's amazing. Is, so was she, is this for like one of the Native American languages or is this that woman in Naples? Um, well, the woman in Naples kind of also, she passed away, oh. um, I think. The woman I believe did the Native American language is still alive. But yeah, she came up with a dictionary and she's teaching others. Um, I don't even think her daughter speaks Native American, but for some odd reason, she wanted to preserve the language and just keep it going. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh my goodness. Yes. If you, if you do find that article, I'd be so curious. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Um, 
Thank you. But how were things um, going, especially with COVID? Because I know that through a lot of musicians all. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, um, it's been interesting. I mean, I think for us, like COVID was a, like a, a, a weird chapter in a few ways. Um, so of course, like all of us, right, there was the whole period of like isolation and, and, but also like during the whole span of COVID, we were actually going through, um, infertility treatments. So like I actually had to get IVF to get pregnant and like that whole process. Uh, well, at first I had to get a surgery, then, you know, it, it just, it was like, it took about two years and that's kind of, so really like we've been tr in this journey of like trying to start a family for the whole period that COVID has been happening. And like uh, that kind of, um, infertility doesn't really allow you to have much of a life anyway. <laughs> so, you know, cause you never know when you need to like be at the doctor's office at like 5 AM to get your blood drawn. It's so it's, it's, I mean, so really, uh, if I, if I could have toured, I probably couldn't have anyway. So, okay. so in that regard, um, I don't know, it was, it, maybe it was like, I hate to say good timing, you know, um, but yeah, we kind of had this other project happening and COVID was happening. And like both of those things combined were sort of like very limiting career wise. Um, but luckily I, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Like I'm finally performing again this month and I'm finally pregnant, you know? And so okay. <laughs> those things combined are good. <laughs> oh, okay. So it all kind of worked out pretty good at the end. Yeah. So, I mean, so far so good. I, you know, I mean, I hate to kind of, I'm always, I'm just taking it like a day at a time, you know, because also I think going through um, something like infertility, I'm not really approaching pregnancy. Like um, I'm convinced that everything's going to work out. Like, you know, I sort of, I still, cause it really, the whole experience does leave you with some emotional trauma. So I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not one of these women that's like, oh, it's going to be great. And, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a more complicated thing. I think once you come from it, from that background, um, but yes, I will say yes, so far, so, so good. Things seem to be going well. So <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and are you a first time mother? Yeah. Yes, I am. I am. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So. <laughs> yeah. I can definitely see um, the reason. Yeah. For some concern. My mom, I'm an only child, wasn't, oh. was supposed to not be able to have kids. And then I popped up. Oh. Um, they were actually wanting to adopt and then right then and there she had me so she's like yep this is a sign I'm gonna yeah. oh but God. yeah she was very nervous very nervous oh I can imagine oh and you know I've heard about that happening um you do hear people say like oh you know um I like everyone knows someone that like they weren't able, they were told they couldn't conceive or they tried and it didn't work. And then they're like, okay, we're adopting. And then as soon as the adoption comes through, they find out they're pregnant or I don't know, you know, something, <laughs> something like that. Oh, but yeah, definitely congratulations. Oh, oh this God. is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I hope you don't mind me talking about it. I was always no. public about it because there's such a stigma around all of this kind of stuff. And it's, I mean, you know, I mean, it's so much more common than we think. And so I really felt like it was important to be like very open about what we had to go through. And um, yeah, and I try to continue to be, to be open about it because yeah, it's, it's not, um, it's not that straightforward for many of us. So, <laughs> so were you kind of nervous during the process and everything? Um was. I mean, I think I was more, I, it sounds odd, but I think I was more anxious when we were trying on our own because I have something called PCOS, like it's polycystic ovarian syndrome. So I always knew there was like something a little off with me in that regard. So my whole life I've been like, okay, when I finally meet someone and I want to have a family, I don't think it's going to be easy. And so I kind of brought all that knowledge into the process, um, which isn't very romantic, of course, like <laughs> anxious from the beginning, right? Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, we tried for a year. And then um, as soon as the doctors stepped in, I actually felt a lot better because I was like, okay, at least like it's out of our hands now. 
and the professionals can just like do their thing and we have the medications and yeah so i even though it seems odd it's like once we entered the medical establishment my my anxiety levels went down quite a bit so oh that's good yeah. and it always seems to help more when you have a good doctor yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we had a really nice doctor, very kind. And, um, you know, everyone we've worked with has been really lovely. So that that's helped as well. Yeah, makes makes a big difference. <laughs> so for for women who want to start a family or have, you know, some issues and everything else, what would you say to them? Oh my gosh. Oh, that's such a great question. Ah, I guess I would say, oh dear. Okay. This is what I would say. I would say, um, if you feel comfortable with it, like be open about it, because I mean, for me, I don't think I could have done it if I wasn't like open and I didn't have a support network that like really, cause it can be so lonely sometimes. And I think if you, if you feel comfortable sharing, what you're going through, you will just be amazed by how many people will come forward and say like, oh, that happened to me too. Like, you know, like it really does bring people out of the woodwork. Um, and so, yes, that would be, that would be like my little piece of advice. I know not everyone likes to be open about something so personal, but I mean, for me, it really made a huge difference. So <laughs> yeah, I've noticed a lot of stories that when people come out and they share their story, it seems like there are so many people that say, oh yeah, I've been there. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. I think that's true. Especially some with, you know, with things that are kind of considered to be a little bit taboo or shameful, even though they shouldn't be, that is like doubly true. Cause we don't, you know, we feel like we have to hide these things. And then if someone says like publicly, like, oh, look, like this happened to me and that, that can really help other people too. So I think all in all, it's, it's a good thing. Um, now to kind of switch yeah. directions, um, if you don't mind. Not at all. I don't mind at all. <laughs> um, when it comes to your music um, and your performing, what have you found um, inspires you? Oh, um, gosh. Ah, that's, oh, your questions are so good. Well, um, I mean, I don't want to give you the obvious answer of like other people's music, which of course is true. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to like listen to other people I, I respect and admire, but um, I think in terms of performing, probably what inspires me the most are performers that, that like they don't just play music, but they also really engage with the audience and tell stories and have like little jokes and I don't know, you know, and just kind of make the whole experience feel like a journey. I've always found that to be really lovely. Like when I was working at that coffee house in college, a lot of the artists were like that. And um, I thought, oh, I, I would like to do that someday. I, I want to really connect with people that way. So that's definitely inspiring. And, um, and also I do, I do get a lot of inspiration from um, non-musical sources like like novels. I'm a big reader and I studied literature in college as well. So um, definitely like poems, short stories, novels, they'll, those can be a great source of inspiration too. Do you have a favorite novel that you enjoy? Oh my goodness, a favorite novel. Um, yes, let's see. Um, I would say probably... I, I like the, I like the big kind of English tomes like uh, Middlemarch and Vanity Fair. You know, I, and I know they're not everyone's cup of tea, but I love those those kinds of novels. So kind of like the old English novels. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do like those a lot for sure. Um, and I love um, Nabokov, who wrote like Belita. Um, I've read a few of his works and some of the Russian authors I really enjoy as well. But uh, yeah, I always seem to go back to the, the kind of like 1700, 1800 uh, English writers as my favorites. <laughs> okay. um, do you have any um, favorite musicians? who inspire you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think my favorites and sort of like the ones that I would call like the most influential for me are, I, I love Lorena McKennett. 
Oh, yes. Yeah. Are you a fan? Yes. I love her music. She, she's, oh, she's like amazing. Um, I would love to see her perform someday. I don't think she tours very much anymore, but hopefully, you know, someday. Uh, have you, have you ever seen her perform or? I have never seen her perform and I've always wanted to, but yes, I've heard a lot of her music. Oh yeah. And she's wonderful. She is. Yeah. So I, I love her. Um, I also love like Gillian Welch. Um, I love her writing. Um, I love Alison Krauss, uh, Ab Abigail Washburn. Um, yeah. And then, and then, um, a beautiful Scottish singer named Kathleen McKinnis. She's a, she's a native Gaelic speaker, Gaelic singer. She's lovely as well. Um, Julie Fowlis. So yeah, it kind of like goes from the, the Celtic to the real kind of Americana, which um, I think is a good reflection of my music in general. So <laughs> have you heard um, Fiona McKenzie? Oh yeah. That name is like so familiar. I'm sure I have. Yeah. Yeah. She, um, also sing Scottish music. Oh, lovely. Yes. I, d I definitely have heard of her. I know she's been recommended to me. So thank you for reminding me. I'm going to try to find some of her music today. <laughs> um, so how, um, how long in college did you study literature and what kind of drew you to that? Um, yeah, so I, I did a four year bachelor's. Um, I was an English major and I, th I think what drew me to it, well, uh, my father's a writer. So I, I definitely grew up in a very like literary household, like everywhere there were like these big bookshelves just packed with wonderful books. And he started reading aloud to me when I was very little, but not children's book, like, like classics, you know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was um, a lot for a five-year-old, but that's okay. And <laughs> I'm sure that, that just got into my subconscious. And <laughs> so I, I think it was probably that and just um, having parents that loved, that loved literature and, and respected it. And then just um, discovering that I too could write, which I think really is just a matter of the fact that that I credit my father for that, for him having probably exposed me to, to good writing really young, um, unless there's some genetic component. I'm not sure about that. Um, that seems like a little bit of a stretch, but I, I think it's, you know, when you're little, you're such a sponge and yes, yeah, you get exposed to something at the right time. I think it can, it can have a great impact. Um, so uh, yeah, so I just, I, I always loved reading and writing and it just seemed kind of when I got to college, that would be the natural course. And, uh, and then I loved music and I thought, well, songwriting is perfect because you can be creative and you can write and you can also sing and you can incorporate music. So it seemed like just like the perfect, perfect combination. <laughs> so um, after your college years, you just did your bachelor's. Is that correct? Yep. 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 Just my bachelor's. Yeah. And after that, so you decided to go on to music. Yeah. Yep. So I, I was playing in college. Like I had a little folk band and I was like doing open mics and I was starting to really get into Celtic music. Um, and, um, and I did, I think I did, I think in the end I did do a music minor, um, and so I was also taking music courses. And, uh, and then right after college is when I went up to Cape Breton to start learning Gaelic. And I was also playing the fiddle at the time, which was kind of something that I've since put aside. Um, <laughs> I know much to the chagrin of anyone that ever had to live with me. Um, <laughs> I know I've heard that many people who have picked it up do a lot of squeaking. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely not a roommate friendly instrument. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. But, uh, but you know, I, I, it was it was fun while it lasted. And then I refocused on guitar. And um, and then after my my year in Scotland, uh, sort of just the, the elements aligned for me to be able to go back to Ireland where I'd spent a semester studying abroad in college to the little town that I lived in that's very musical Dingle in Ireland um, oh, okay yeah yeah do you know of Dingle 
Yes, I've heard of it. Yes, I've never been, but yeah, I've heard oh. quite a few musicians who come from yeah. Bengal and then from Donegal. And yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a great, great, beautiful little town. Um, magical. And uh, so, yeah, so it worked out for me to go back there to record my first album. And that was that was about 10 years ago. So it's been 10 years since that album came out. And that kind of was what really set me up for like having a, a professional career and making a living with, with music, even though even getting to that point, of course, took some time, but yeah, but um, that was kind of where it all, it all began. And then uh, my second album was recorded in Scotland, my third in Louisiana, and I have yet to decide what, what we're going to do for the fourth, but <laughs> Okay, so you have a fourth album that's coming. Yeah, well, yeah, so I basically, I have nearly all the songs written, and um, the plan was if I can still go to Italy, we were going to take the photos there, and then I I'm going to hopefully do a Kickstarter, like, sometime this summer, uh, so, yeah, so it's it's very beginning stages, but yes, some, something is in the works. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, for your third album, um, I noticed um, the music videos and everything, oh, which are very lovely. Oh, and forgive oh. me, I know the title in the title is Forgetting. Can you tell oh, me the yeah, title of yeah, your No worries, that The Art of Forgetting. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, but does that kind of inspire the music videos then? Yeah, I mean, I think for, for the videos, gosh, I, I, I was spoiled because for probably the two that you saw, um, I worked with this really wonderful videographer who was like very creative himself. And he always brought these like amazing ideas. Um, so I kind of would have like a general sense of where I wanted it to be and like the sort of the look, but then he, he, I don't know, he just had a way of kind of like taking it to the next level and like almost making like a story, even out of something as simple as me just being on a beach. It's like, he could make a story out of that. So <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, very talented guy. I hope, I hope I get to work with him again someday. <laughs> um, so you say um, you're getting ready to go back to touring and everything. Yeah. Um, where does that include your touring schedule? Yeah, well, so this month I've been kind of around New England. Um, and then you, of course, you know, next month is, is hopefully Italy. And then in April, I, as long as my health permits it, I'm hoping to be uh, in kind of like rural New York and down into Pennsylvania. Um, and then I'm going to take May and June off. And then kind of like um, probably the summer might be a little bit of New England. And then in September, I'll go back to like rural, rural New York and, um, and see, see what happens there. And then next winter, I've got at least one date scheduled in Florida, which will turn into a tour at some point. But um, yes, so <laughs> it's a little bit of all over the place right now. But yeah, it it's, feels so good to be, to be back at it finally. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, so tell me, where can people find you if they're interested in your music and learning more about you? Yeah, well, I would say like my website is the is the best place, just kyleannecary.com. So K-Y-L-E-A-N-N-E-C-A-R-E-Y.com. And uh, any of like the social media connector, connectors are like all there. And I would say like probably Instagram and Facebook are where I'm most active. But yeah, those can be found on my website. Okay. Well, thank you so much for doing this interview. I appreciate it. You're so welcome, Helen. You know, and I mean, I love doing these, but then I always feel like I feel bad because I'm like, I, do, I know so little about you. And so. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't feel bad. Yes. Oh, but just tell me, are you, are you from Ohio originally or? 